Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Lisa Howie. I'm the owner of uh, Black Pony Gallery and, and also the Atlantic World Art Fair. I'm delighted to have your attention for the next few minutes as I discuss the artists that I will feature in uh, this year's iteration of the Atlantic World Art Fair. Just a quick background uh, for those who may not know, I started uh, Black Pony Gallery as an online entity in 2019 on Artsy and I feature emerging to established artists who reside in the Azores, Bermuda, Cuba, the Bahamas, Cayman, and Turks and Caicos. And to further the vision I have for the gallery, I started the Atlantic World Art Fair. I believe I positioned it also within a time of crisis as galleries and our island economies were struggling and continue to actually through the pandemic and post-pandemic world. And the Atlantic World Art Fair today exists as the only online art market which is dedicated to the contemporary visual art makers in the Caribbean mid-Atlantic region. And as I said earlier, we go into our third iteration um, and this year we start June 1st. So I do hope that you can check us out online and to follow our progress. Pro progress. Hi, I'm delighted to be working with Hezron. He comes out of Turks and Caicos and this is the style of work that we can expect from him in this Atlantic World Art Fair where he will be presenting four large scale paintings using the same materials of acrylic, oil and pastel on paper uh, with very much this um, aesthetic. And just to give a bit of background on Hezron, he has a portfolio that um, really speaks to this same style and uh, you will always be able to expect these very vibrant colors um, He's one of Turks and Caicos' most prolific artists, and he's exhibited in cities across Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom. He's been featured at Carafesta in Trinidad, Tobago, and um, he was recently uh, a juror for a competition hosted by See Me. And he's been featured in several publications such as Beautiful Bazaar Magazine, Wacom's The Next Level, and the Turks and Caicos Magazine itself. So about this particular work, um, he talks about memory and he says, memory is a fickle thing. What becomes of a people that forget who they are? In this precursor of paintings for his newest and most ambitious series, Hezron H delves deeper into themes of identity and its connection to the memory of a people through the land of flora. Interweaving flora found in the Turks and Caicos, he begins to explore what is lost and what can be imagined and what can be gained in the symbiosis between the land and its inhabitants, its mortality and its mortality, this conversation around evolution and de-evolution and the fight for survival. I think, you know, we've got some big words and big ideas um, and a figure in this landscape where we obviously are situated both in land and sea here. Um, I, love, I love this um, character of the cactus or, or some shadow effect of, of a living life um, sort of looming over his, his figure in the center there and, uh, and the boldness of the colors of, of the figure, uh, which remind me sort of, of, of not just of different artists' work, but I'm thinking more of sort of colors of yellow and red and almost how they sort of signify interesting in the retail market. Um, I'm not sure, I don't wanna, I don't wanna spell out what's reminding me specifically with those colors, but it, it does jump out to me as very strong. And I'm enjoying how there's a peacefulness and there's a restlessness that's within the work. Um, and again, I keep coming up back to the right-hand side of this, this, this figure of life that's uh, looming over the, the gentleman in the center. We can expect works of this nature when we look at Hezron's uh, series in the Atlantic World Art Fair with his very sort of fauvist colors of the face and uh, and almost an anthropomorphic element happening, not just with the sort of the, the trees, but also that it almost feels like the figure themselves might be in a state of transformation too. Um, and I'm quite intrigued by Hezron's work. So I really hope that you enjoy that. Of course, the word communion, we can't look past uh, in terms of being both faith-based and action-oriented, um, communion with nature, and communion with gods, plural. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing more of his work. Nasaria Cholet is the next artist. She's very recently joined me. Uh, she's based in the Cayman Islands. She grew up in Georgetown and Green Cayman, 
grand came in and uh, she says that without television, she learned how to play and uh, and really develop her imagination. Um, and that uh, she also learned how to express her, express her emotions through storytelling, play acting and art. Um, Nasseria has a BFA in theater from Howard University and an MFA in theater education from NYU. And she is a founding member of the Native Sons Artists Collective who seek to develop an authentic Caymanian art aesthetic. And she cites her references as Romare Bearden, Faith Ringgold, Tessa Mars, and Frida Kahlo. She's an award winner. She recently uh, concluded a solo exhibition at the National Gallery of Cayman entitled All the Coals We Left in the Fire. And her work has been collected extensively. Um, this particular work, I think, um, very much captures this, the series that we will see in the Atlantic World Art Fair. She will present five uh, original paintings that include mixed media. In this case, the series uh, involves acrylic, collage, enamel, embroidery, and needle on wood panel. I'm just going to give you some time to have a look at, closely at some of the details in her work. And uh, I just love that you find that thread and needle hanging from a flower suspended to the house there. And how this seer as a figure is both inside and without. She's inside this world where we locate as, as home. We have our home. She's overseeing that. And yet she's sort of emerging simultaneously from both the ocean and the landscape. Um, we have a sun or a version of a sun, perhaps a bird larger than the sun um, and these sort of lovely details to the, the figure where the hair color um, has such a wonderful texture uh, to this face, to this body that um, really makes this figure feel almost mythological in nature. She says about the work that she's honoring the intuitive work of Caymanian artist Gladwin Miss Lassie Bush and the work celebrates the ability of artists to see into other universes and to interpret the past for the benefit of the future and to grab a hold of fleeting moments of clarity that others consider madness and turn the eye inward in order to search for pure truth. The bird here is the representation of the second mind which sits and observes the madness of distractions, allowing them to be acknowledged and then to pass. So I look forward to uh, to working with this area and, uh, and, to, and to watch her style evolving. Um, I really hope that you enjoy the series that we will present. And what's interesting with this, um, with the body of work I'm showing for the Atlantic World Art Fair this year, we can go to the next slide to Neil's Rays, is that without actually um, setting it up as such, the artists are all communicating people in a time of place. And, um, and that was not a set theme I had asked of them. I found this very interesting how that uh, all of the artists came forward with works that present people in interesting perspectives. And here's Niels. Uh, I've been working with Niels for the last few years, super talented. He's a graduate from the Higher Institute of Art and Cuba, he's had over 10 solo exhibitions in Cuba, Spain, Switzerland, Panama, group exhibitions where he's been showcased in Cuba, Denmark, France, the United States, Spain, Mexico, China, Finland, Canada, Panama, Austria, Germany, and England. And he holds the first um, prize, the grand prize of the first post-it contemporary competition held in Cuba in 2013. He's been a resident artist in the Ministry of Culture of Austria, as well as in China, uh, and resides in Havana. And for those of you who are aware of the context of, of Cuba, um, that pandemic, post-pandemic, um, American presidents to American presidents, um, Cuba continues to very much struggle economically. And, um, and I think what I see in this series of Neil's for this uh, group presented in the fair with three paintings, all of which have a very social political commentary while he may be referencing stylistically, uh, very obviously we see Picasso and we sort of have the cloud and the sky of Rene Magritte. Um, I think what we also see is, is that there's a third shadow, which feels very much like the person, the original, perhaps the artist himself, and then the dual characters of his figure, perhaps playing the dual roles of living in a, in a totalitarian regime, which is essentially what we could describe Cuba as, and I know that he would not be upset with me using that word, um, 
but the duality of the face uh, or the looking twice over one shoulder, I, I think is very much speaking to the context of existing in Cuba today. I know that uh, Neil's struggles on occasion uh, for material goods in order to keep making. So every time we travel to, to Havana, we take painting, we take paints and we take brushes um, and that you know he's able to continue in a very robust, aggressive way making paintings uh, under very dire situations. And I just, I commend him and I commend all of the artists uh, working in the, under, under those conditions, both in Havana and other places world. Um, Yo Dentro is the title inside me is how I would interpret that. And again, again, I think we're looking at this kind of the duality or tribe, tribe uh, prism perspective of a person's sense of self in a very complex uh, space and place. Um, for those who aren't aware of Neil's work, he doesn't talk about these as portraits. He talks about these as faces, faces that sort of come to him in his imagination. He says that about a face, he said, when we face a face, we are before the frontier of the self, before the most sophisticated interface that can exist, the most authentic expression of the human. I don't think I can find a more powerful subject to represent, says Neil's Rays. 78 by 59 inches. Uh, this is also the scale of work that he likes to to uh, to complete in. And uh, and for those of you who own any of his work or have seen and experienced it in, in person, you know that his portraits have very powerful, uh, almost overwhelmedness uh, for audiences. We're going to transition now to James Cooper. And James has created uh, a series that's ongoing uh, related to Elon Musk, and I'll speak to that in a moment. But just to say uh, about James himself, he's been put, uh, an active photographer over the last 25 years. We uh, come to know each other through Bermuda National Gallery when I was the executive director there. And I work with James several times for solo exhibitions and also for Bermuda Biennial exhibitions. Um, but he cites his discovery um, and his kind of emergence into the international platform, gives credit to curator Tim Barber, who uh, recognized his talents in 2008. Um, James's artwork has been featured in many local and international projects and publications, including Juxtapose, The Dear Dave magazine, ARC magazine, the See Me Here anthology, as well as Pictures from Paradise, Photography from the Caribbean. He's also been exhibited at Alice Yard in Trinidad, the National Art Galleries of the Bahamas, the National Art Gallery of Jamaica, uh, the Ghetto Biennial in Haiti, the Brighton UK Photo Festival, the New York Photo Festival, Toronto Photo Festival, and Foundation Clement. And his artwork is in the collection of Bermuda National Gallery, as well as the private collector of renown, Kenneth Montague, based in Toronto. So this work uh, is entitled Snorkeling with Elon Musk um, Forever is a digital photograph and he is responding to something that Musk has said that um, that there is no way to prove that we are not living in a computer simulation. This is these are the words of Elon Musk. And James says about this, he says, you know, I thought this was a strange way to think about life, but it raised interesting visual possibilities. There's no question that we are living in a great in a time rather of great concern for our natural world, for the health of our oceans and with a certain uncertainty about our relationship with the digital realm in general. Um, so expect uh, four works very similar to this in terms of body or bodies underwater and this sort of blurring of uh, understanding who the body is and what condition are they uh, in and whether or not they're safe there. I feel there's a sense of both beauty and grace and um, and sort of, a, for me, I get a sense of um, almost like a powerlessness. I'm so concerned for the depth of this body <laughs> and their return to surface. And will they will be will they arrive okay? Or or you know, in questioning along with James and, and Elon Musk, do they even exist? And and to what are we actually looking at? So I look forward to uh, to reactions on uh, on James's series in the Atlantic World Art Fair. John Reno Jackson is is out there also joining me. He's a very recent uh, addition to Black Pony Gallery. I'm excited to work with John. He's an interdisciplinary artist who's based in Grand Cayman, but at the moment, actually, he's uh, he's underway with a BFA at the Slade School of Fine Art, University College, London. Um, prior to setting off to London, he had attended foundational courses at the Art Academy in London, 
Um, he's received mentorship as well from the Terps Correspondence Course as well. And he uh, evolves his practice through residency and educational programs. For example, he was in the Pada Studios. He was the first Caymanian artist to attend the residency program in Barreiro, Portugal. And in the summer of 22, he also attended the Caribbean linked sixth iteration in Aruba. Um, his works have also been featured in the National Gallery of the Cayman Islands, including A Heron Amongst the Storm, which was his first solo show in 22, 20,000, sorry, 2022. And also in 2020, he was featured in Island of Woman, Life at Home in Our Maritime Years, as well as the Cayman Islands Second Biennial and the People's Collection, a 25-Year Cultural Legacy. And he's re received grants from Catapult um, as well. So uh, an emerging artist whose uh, work is collected in the museums, he's in private collections, Cayman uh, Islands, Canada, US, the Netherlands, the UK, Israel, and Portugal. And he's also featured uh, in two hotels in Grand Cayman, Palm Heights, and the Ritz-Carlton. So here we're looking at this wonderful abstraction. I could spend so much time in this piece. Um, and I love the title, Watching as Something Grows, whether or not we're referencing something growing perhaps in nature or uh, an evolution of an identity. And he says about this work, um, I think it has become more important than ever to produce, produce artwork that explores the theme of the body and its relationship to the self and to the wider society in which we live. Abstract expressionist artists like Willem de Kooning and Max Pechstein, along with Caymanian artists, sort of the founder of Caymanian contemporary art, Bendel Hides, uh, to John all exemplify what it means to unpack the relationship between the body and the self. He says that like them, those artists, he says, I seek to subjectively depict my subjects with a heightened and emotionally charged color palette in order to tap into the, the subconscious rather than simply idealize the figure. John says about his paintings that they further ask viewers to consider if the relative absence of discernible figuration indicates an obscuring of perception or rather an enhancing of it through the dispensing of expectations about the appearance and meaning of images. And perhaps he's hitting also on why I love abstract art so much too, which is that it does open up endless possibilities. Um, there's a timelessness, I think, in, in what he's rendering in abstraction as well, which for me feels like I could come back to the work again and again and timelessly spend uh, moments with the work, discovering new things or having new feelings. Um, there's a lot of positive energy in this, not just through the palette choice, but for me, it feels like it's communicating. There's a lot of positive information and I'm really, really enjoying my exploration with John. I hope that you will too. Um, he will be presenting uh, three abstract paintings in the Atlantic World Art Fair. Going on to Dee Dee Brown, um, I've just recently been working with Dee Dee on an intimate exhibition that was opened um, at the Coldwell Banker in Nassau. And um, Dee Dee is uh, very dedicated to her craft. She was born in Fury Report, Grand Bahama. Uh, she studied at the Savannah College of Art and Design, has a BFA in interior design with a minor in photography. In the last 10 years, she's been practicing as a freelance artist and photographer. Uh, she has three permanent sculptures, uh, two in the Nassau airport and one in the Baja Mar resort, um, which means you just have to go to Nassau to see some of her work. And she currently resides in Spanish Wells, Eleuthera, where she works from home. And if you haven't followed her Instagram, please do because you get to see these incredible photographs out her window. I've never seen a studio space like it, almost like directly onto the beach. And for many years, Dee Dee's been exploring the themes of, of empowerment, particularly as it relates to female figures or androgynous figures, often crowning them as she is here with this beautiful sea fan. And um, as entitled Floating Head Six. So for those who have followed Dee Dee's work, she presented a Floating Head series uh, in Atlantic World Art for 2022. And I'm delighted that she continues to work in the same subject area. They're small, intimate pieces, right? It's seven by eight inches, it's on copper. And look at the material choices. You know, she's got digital art, photography, image transfer, ink, beads, and shells on copper. In the next slide, we see uh, this on close up so that you can uh, get a sense of looking closely at the work. 
if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, Didi says about her life and practice, she says she's lucky to live in a very soothing, serene and beautiful place. And she gains a lot of inspiration from the colors, light and textures that surround her. The more that she engages with her environment, the more evident that the intricate details become clear to her. She loves focusing on these details, working with mixed media, which allows her so many opportunities to play and to constantly bring new aspects of her environment into the work. She says, the more I practice this, the more I realize how much it sets a tone and background for my narratives. I just love, there's something about strength and fragility in Didi's work. Um, and we just, if I look at the detail of the eye, right, the capacity of power that's in the figure and that beauty. And then of course we know uh, for all of us shell collectors uh, or fan coral people who, if you ever found a piece of fan coral, you know how delicate those objects are. Uh, and then to dimensionalize them with her figure there, I think is just absolutely stunning. So look forward to uh, two works like this, the one that I'm featuring here and another. And um, I believe some beautiful surprises for those of you who don't know her photography, that you'd be introduced to that during this Atlantic World Art Fair. Also excited to present Aimee Garcia, who I've been working with for the last few years. Aimee comes from Cuba. She's presently living and working in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I'm delighted for her to have that opportunity because I know at the, at the most she is, of course, being uh, given wide access to whatever materials that she wishes to use. She was born in Matanzas in Cuba, and she also, like Niels, graduated from the Higher Institute of Art in Havana. Um, her work has been exhibited extensively in the United States, Mexico, Germany, England, and Spain, and Italy. She's participated in the 57th Venice Biennale, the Biennial of Havana several times, the Biennial of Guangzhou in South Korea, the Biennial of uh, Cuenca, I think I'm pronouncing it properly, in Ecuador, and the Biennial of Painting of the Caribbean and Central America in Aruba. Her works are in public collections, such as the National Museum of Fine Arts in Havana, ASU Art Museum, Arizona, the Neighborhood Museum in New York, the University of Virginia Art Museum, Virginia, Jordan Schneitzer, University of Oregon, the Museum of Finest Cuban Arts at Mafka in Vienna, Austria, the Farber Cuban avant-garde collection, et cetera, including the Paris Art Museum. Um, about her work, I believe we see her work and I want to read it through this lens of feminism, although she doesn't talk about it specifically as feminism, sort of as a universal womanhood. Um, her work invites us to reflect on life, history, gender, contradictions, memory in the political social environment, she says, and She's looking at both the feminine, as I said, and the sort of universal considerations of their narratives. I may says about her work that I believe that the individual is in constant search of a change, liberation, emancipation, but external and psychological factors, factors prevent achieving that total emancipation. That is why that search becomes a constant where sometimes we feel more trapped and in others we believe we have achieved some form of liberation. So in the detail, if you look a little bit closer, we can see that while we can assume uh, there's a, acrylic and oil in the next work, we see the detail of the ribbons on canvas. And I do own her work. And when you do see them close up, it's wonderful to have the experience of the layers and this tension that exists between the figure and their sense of beauty and grace. If we go back to the previous slide, please, then we can see this figure sort of pushing out or attempting to be both beautified by the ribbons. And, and it's interesting about the ribbon choice because we put them in our hair, particularly for, for young girls. Uh, we use ribbons to wrap gifts. And yet in this instance, of course, we have an echo of some kind of fence or barrier or window that's gated. And so um, that tension between emancipation and freedom is very clear in this work. Um, the red, of course, we can't look past in terms of color, uh, usage in terms of red and uh, thinking about the communist regime of Cuba um, and the sort of the subtlety of that blue green, almost an echo of um, sort of the camouflage or the, or the material of conflict. Um, so yes, as I mentioned earlier that this grouping of artists are all speaking to figures, people in, in very different senses of place um, uh, and I think in, in many, many ways, speaking to our times, um, whether they are referencing living on an island 
or living sort of within the confines of a particular regime or in consideration of various freedoms or, or limitations uh, that exist for all of us where it relates to social, political, econ economic structures. And just as a closing to say that I, I really hope that you're um, taking time to, to listen to each of our presentations by the galleries and, uh, and that I hope that what I have done is given you some information and details that may assist you in making the decision to have that, um, to make that investment. Um, and I'm available, you know, we're, we're all here to answer your questions. I look forward to, to learning more about all the collectors who are following the Atlantic World Art Fair and uh, to, to developing this project further. So thank you from Black Coney Gallery and all the best, best wishes to Atlantic World Art Fair 2023. Mm -hmm.